This podcast is brought to you by North Carolina's Electric Cooperatives. This is NC Spin, an unrehearsed discussion on issues of interest to North Carolinians. Now, here is your moderator, Tom Campbell. Thank you for tuning in to this week's NC Spin. Judges and court rulings dominate this week's news, and we begin with UNC essentially punting and asking a judge to tell him what to do with Silent Sam. Next, we debate a ruling that Republicans say killed any chance for Medicaid expansion in our state, and we move on to an appellate court ruling that stymies voter ID, probably for the whole year. Of course, we're going to ask the panel to tell us something we don't know. And on this week's panel, we welcome, as one of our new panelists, Erica Palmer-Smith uh, with Care for Carolina, also a political analyst, Becky Gray, VP of the John Locke Foundation, Rob Schofield, Director of NC Policy Watch, and Rick Henderson, Editor-in-Chief of the Carolina Journal. We begin our uninterrupted debate after these brief messages from our underwriters. In more than 21 years on NC Spin, I never endorsed a product or sponsor, but I volunteered to do this message for family physicians. Over the past 40 years, my family doctor could quickly diagnose my illnesses because he knew my medical history. Evidence suggests I'll live longer, have a higher quality of life, and save 33% on health care costs. I believe in my trusted relationship with my family physician. Family Physicians, your trusted health care advisor for life. Life's busy, but you're in control. As an electric cooperative member, you have access to lots of tools to help manage your home energy use and budget, so you can focus on what's most important. Let's get started. Uh, before we do, I, I want to uh, explain flags were flying at half mast throughout the state of North Carolina, acknowledging the death of two fine politicians in our state this week. Lieutenant Governor Bob Jordan was a good businessman, a loyal NC State supporter, a fine politician, and a really good man, and he will be missed. Uh, and we also mourn the loss of Cabarrus County legislator Linda Johnson, who'd served 10 terms in the legislature and was one of the House budget leaders. Uh, we'll miss both of them. All right, now, let's get started. Last week we talked about the ruling by Judge Alan Bedour that negated the deal of UNC had made with the Sons of Confederate Veterans. This week, the university was back in court asking Bedour for help. First to obtain the return of Sam to the university, but more importantly, they wanted Bedour to tell them what to do after they got Sam back. The university essentially punted, acknowledging they don't know how to solve this problem and ensure the safety of students while at the same time complying with a 2015 law passed by the legislature. It doesn't appear to give them a lot of flexibility. Rick Henderson, if you read that law, it looks like they're going to have to return Silent Sam to McCorkle Place. Is that your reading? That's one reading of the law. Uh, there is a provision, and you mentioned the word safety in the law, which does allow the custodian of uh, a monument to say we're not going to put it back where it originally sat if there is a significant risk to safety. That I'm, I'm imagining is what UNC's Board of Governors is probably going to hope Judge Bedour does. I'm not sure that publicly they're going to talk a lot about that because that's going to anger a lot of people who would like to see the statue back there. But it seems to me as if that is a way to avoid continued problems, at least continuing problems. Of Erica, isn't this kind of like we, we saw during the Bill Clinton impeachment era when he said it depends on what the definition of is is? <laughs> well, what is the definition of safety? Can anybody define that? Well, I think in this scenario, because the statue has already been toppled once, you know, there's not really a question as to whether or not there's a security risk. It, it's going to happen again. Um, it, first and foremost, UNC is an educational institution. So I would certainly hope that they would put the impact that this is going to have on students um, and their safety ahead of those other concerns. Well, Silent Sam's definitely taking them to school. I don't think there's any question <laughs> about it. Why did they go back to, why did they turn to Bedour? 
<laughs> to get help on this. He was the one that got him into this problem to start off with, wasn't he? Well, I think they're kind of hoping somebody else is going to tell him what to do because this is, thing has gone back and forth and back and forth with no real resolution to it. I mean, Silent Sam right now is hiding out somewhere in a warehouse somewhere. I'm not sure we even know where it is, what to do with him. Um, you know, it's and the you know, as Erica pointed out, the safety concerns on the campus, you know, is certainly part of this. But, you know, Tom, it just seems to me this whole thing is symbolic of what we've been dealing with for the last 150 years of, you know, what is North Carolina's position in the Civil War? What is the obligation? What of the history do we want to talk about? Do we want to celebrate? Do we want to further explore? And that's how this all has come about. It seems to me that it's symbolic of many things that we've dealt with, again, for the last 150 years. Well, Rob, you can't blame the UNC Board of Governors for asking Badur for help. I mean, they're caught between a rock and a hard place here. I on the one hand, if they put him back on campus, yeah. uh, then they got all kinds of problems there, uh, dealing with safety and so forth like that. But if they don't, they got problems with that 2015 law. You're well, our lawyer. <laughs> well, let me say that there are actually a lot of laws that play here. It's not just the 2015 law. There are actually other statutes. There are federal civil rights statutes that come into play. You can't have a camp accept federal uh, education money and have a campus that uh, maintains an atmosphere that's hostile to people of color, which is what quite arguably Silent Sam does. I think there are not only do they have a they have a political problem here, but I think there is a legal out. I think both. Our other panelists are right. This uh, safety exemption provides a way out. But I think there's also a very strong legal argument that there are other laws that apply here and that 2015 law doesn't necessarily govern. And, of course, it ought to be repealed. You know, Joe Mavretic last week had a, a solution. He suggested putting Sam back on McCorkle Place and then building uh, a marble sarcophagus around him. <laughs> so he'd be back, but, but he'd be covered. <laughs> well, that... Uh... Until until people come out there with chisels and start Le leaving the map ready to come up with unique <laughs> well, solutions. You know, I think what's one thing that may well happen is that the historical commission may have to weigh in on this. What they do? Yeah, they've with been silent in all this whole process. <laughs> yeah, that, well, they haven't really been asked to weigh in yet. Now, I, as Rob said, I think the law may have to be revised in some way. Where Silent Sam is probably going to be somewhere. Perhaps the General Assembly is going to have to come in here and and say. Let's get together with the Department of Cultural and Natural Resources. Let's look very much at perhaps having a monument park somewhere in North Carolina for Civil War monuments to allow them to be relocated to a place where they can be put in perspective. That may have to be the only uh, solution. Another possibility, though, Erica, is that the legislature could change this law. I you know, I think this is a clear sign that the legislature needs to do their jobs and address this law. Um, I would certainly hope that they would change it, um, but if not, this is something they need to weigh in on. Yeah, I'm not sure that I've got that long to wait. Uh, <laughs> We're not holding our breath. One thing, Becky, that hasn't been raised in this, I watched the hearing uh, that they had a week ago. Uh, not a word has been said about that $75,000 that, that the UNC Board of Governors paid the Sons of Confederate Veterans and other groups never to protest on their campus again. Right. Well, I think there's some concern and there's some efforts saying that those groups should give that money back to the university that was university money that was not intended for that kind of purpose. I mean, there's a question about that, too, just the intent and what the money went for and if it can be returned, should it be returned, who you know, in what time frame, and th so that that's part of it too. I mean, as you mentioned, there's the legal questions, but there's also the monetary question. In this. We'll go around the horn very quickly. What's going to happen with Sam? Uh, it's not coming back for sure. It'll end up in a warehouse or maybe in this memorial park that Rick's talking about, but it's definitely not coming back. Erica? To I would agree. I think even if the, the judge tells them to come back, this is a story that plays out a lot longer. Yeah tied up in more courts actions. I, th I think we're missing an opportunity if we don't use this as some sort of context. I've long said we need more monuments and more explanations and more context of the history that we have in North Carolina. I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I think there's an opportunity there. Rick? Not McCorkle Place, perhaps Bennett Place. Hmm. That had been suggested before, mm -hmm. but for some reason or another, the Board of Governors did not take that recommendation. No, they didn't. I mean, North Carolina lost more casualties in the Civil War than any other state. But we had some of the least amount of action, except for the fact when Stoneman sort of plowed through North Carolina. But other than that, we didn't really have, we don't have the battlefield parks that other states have. Sherman did come up through Georgia and camped out on the Capitol grounds, if I see that. Uh, that's right. Let's change subjects. 
The state's fiscal year began July 1st without an approved budget. The primary issue that prevented an agreement was Medicaid expansion. Now, no matter which side of that argument you're on, a federal appeals court ruling this week essentially killed any hope of getting Medicaid expansion in our state, or did it? That ruling said that any work requirement attached to Medicaid benefits was arbitrary and capricious. Now, the uh, issue is officially dead in Arkansas and nine other states that wanted to do it, uh, but John Hood wrote a column this week, one of our panelists, urging leaders to convene and resolve their budget differences immediately. I'm going to ask Erica Palmer Smith the first question. Before I do, I need to, to give a, a, a disclosure. Uh, Erica was booked to be on this show several weeks ago and did not know what the topic was going to be this week. Her organization, Care for Carolinas, has been one that has been promoting Medicaid expansion to the legislature uh, throughout the, the, the course of the last session or so. But I wanted to disclose that so that our viewers would know it. Erica, this is a double-edged sword for Democrats. They're opposed to having work requirements tied to Medicaid eligibility. Uh, a lot of people are saying, wait just a second here. This Arkansas ruling doesn't necessarily preclude North Carolina uh, from using work requirements. Tell, explain that to us. Right. Well, the Arkansas ruling doesn't apply to North Carolina. Um, it, number one, it's specific to the situation in Arkansas. But also, if you read that ruling, um, it looks at the specific failure to consider coverage losses. So in Arkansas, they knocked 18,000 people off the rolls who were already receiving that coverage. That's not what we're looking at in North Carolina. And so, you know, the obituary on House Bill 655 is being written prematurely. That bill, what it would do is provide a new insurance product to individuals, working families who are currently locked out of insurance. Um, it would not be taking insurance away from anyone. Um, and with half a million North Carolinians, most of whom are working, um, currently lacking that health insurance, and a vast majority of voters, including a majority of Republicans, um, who want the legislature to find a way to close this gap, um, I think this is something they still have to deal so your, with. Your position is, as I understand it, that Arkansas was going to apply to people who were already Medicaid recipients. Our bill was just for new recipients for Medicaid, new applicants for Medicaid, is that correct? That's right, Arkansas had expanded Medicaid with sort of a pure- All, what, all across the board. Across the board, you know, just automatically Medicaid expansion happened and they went back in and did a waiver to add those work requirements, that kind of thing. What we're talking about in North Carolina is putting together a solution that we can all agree on. We had a bipartisan bill, you know, Let's push that forward in a way that includes but some provisions. But we couldn't all agree on it, to, to interrupt you just a second here, because it never came to the floor for a vote. HB 65, 655 never got a vote on the floor from the, Speaker Moore never brought it to the floor. I, let me ask a more basic question, Rick. Uh, when Bill Clinton was president, this is the second time we've mentioned his name. <laughs> when Bill Clinton was president, he instituted work requirements for people who were receiving uh, federal uh, benefits. Uh, nobody, I, there was some backlash to it, but it, it went into effect. It, everybody agreed that it worked pretty well. Um, there's some speculation this verdict is going to be appealed to the Supreme Court. Do you think it will? And if so, what are its chances? An appeal is, uh, I, would, I don't know if it's probable, but I would say that it's quite, it's quite possible to happen. And I have no idea what the Supreme Court will say because you're talking about uh, something that is that's different than the TANF requirement than the earlier thing that Bill Clinton did was the, the welfare reform. Right, right, or, right. So you're talking about something that involves not only uh, that that does involve a benefit that is provided by either a state agency or a private company. Uh, there are all sorts of differences between health care coverage and simply providing things like food stamps or, or other sorts right, of things right, like right. that. So that's why uh, it, it does pose a different set of legal questions, and I'm not a lawyer, Rob, is I'm not. But the thing is, too, with North Carolina, that still doesn't mean that North Carolinians, especially the folks in the leadership of the General Assembly, have any more stomach to well, do this now. Okay, let's play what if here, Rob. Yeah. Uh, Representative Donnie Lamberth, who, who sponsored this <clears throat> bill, uh, was the right. one who read the eulogy for it right after this ruling came out. Is there a way the legislature and the governor can can negotiate this and save it? 
uh, Moore wouldn't even bring it to the floor of the House, and the Senate was pretty well decided uh, they didn't want to hear it anyway. I mean, the, the hard fact is that a lot of folks on the right don't want any kind of Medicaid expansion. I think that's, that's fair to say. That's what Berger's position. This bill, I think it passed out of committee 25 to 6, and yet it didn't get a vote on the floor because the right wing in the Republican Party and the House, I guess, didn't want it. Speaker Moore didn't want it. The fact of the matter, though, is that these work requirements are a lousy idea. They're enormously wasteful. That's why the court struck them down. They waste all kinds of money because we spend all this money on bureaucracy checking up on people who are working two to three jobs and maybe they work 20 hours this week and 40 hours that week. It's hard to meet these requirements. So we're saying in North Carolina, hundreds of thousands of people are not going to have well, health coverage because we want some people to as work. As a matter of fact, uh, the Kaiser uh, uh, Family Foundation released a report this past week showing that 13% of the people in our state have no health insurance. Right. There's about 15% with Medicaid, 15% with Medicare, and about 40% who have insurance through their employers. Um, does our state have an obligation uh, to try to help provide health care to these 13% who doesn't have, don't have any? I, 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 think it, I think if there is a situation where health insurance is too expensive for people to afford, we absolutely need to address that. And there's kind of two ways that you can go with it. One is you can accept that medical costs are escalating and are too high. Yeah. Um, there's a problem with access and there's, you know, we want to ensure the quality of care. So there's two ways you can go with it. Either you can just have government pay for everything or you can go the other way and you can look at ways to address those things that are driving up the cost of health care to put it out of reach of many people. And the, the, the lowering health care costs with things like getting rid of North Carolina's ridiculous certificate of need requirements, um, using more telemedicine ways of administering right. medicine, um, expanding scope of practice so that mid-level providers who are trained to do certain things but, are but allowed get, to do those. Let's get those. back to the Medicaid provision. Uh, Erica, there's some people that are suggesting that maybe this ruling is a good way for both the governor and the legislature to save some face here and get on about the business of getting this budget resolved. Do you think that might happen? Well, you know, I, I don't. And I wish, I wish that it would um, because I think that we have a lot of folks who are hurting right now from a lot of different reasons um, that need us to get a new budget passed in North Carolina. But that being said, we're talking, uh, you know, I think it was a great point about this isn't just about getting more coverage to a certain population of people. We need to improve health care for everyone in North Carolina. But one of the wonderful things about were we to close the coverage gap, were we to find a way that we can all agree and close the coverage gap, then we're going to see things like hospital and provider costs go down because they're not dealing with uncompensated care with emergency room visits from folks who can't deal with their high blood pressure. And that's a big issue. There's no question about it. Uh, coming together, that, that phrase that you mentioned, coming together, that's been the stumbling block. This thing has other ripples through it, not having a budget, Rick. Uh, we talked about this a, a little bit uh, in a previous show. This, this Medicaid reform, this managed care Medicaid program that the legislature passed, I think it was 2015, um, because of the fact that we don't have a budget, DHHS is facing a cash shortage, um, we were due to be rolling it out sometime this spring. Uh, now DHS said they've had to lay off 163 contract employees. The, um, in addition to that, there are five managed care organizations that have hired people. They say they're hemorrhaging uh, three to five million dollars a month because there is no budget. Uh, do you think that Given all that's going on here, we might be able to at least figure out a way to get a money to, to, I mean, we've got this surplus of a billion dollars sitting over there. From your lips to Roy Cooper's ears. I mean, the governor is the one who vet, vetoed the Medicaid transformation bill and refused to, I mean, basically would not revisit it when the General Assembly tried to override it. His own <laughs> Secretary of Health and Human Services, Mandy Cohen, it says, I'm in trouble. But the governor's not listening. So Come on, go, Rick, go straight. It's not just the governor. The General Assembly is the one that hasn't been willing to sit down with him. Berger and Moore are the ones who haven't been willing to negotiate this thing. Governor Cooper has tried to sit down with him multiple times. I, I disagree that that's that he's the roadblock here. The, all of them need to get together in a room and work this darn thing out. They could do it if they sat down and both sides came in realizing that they've they've got to compromise. They could they've do got it. To give they could do it very quickly. Becky, you live over there a lot during the course of the session. Uh, they're, they're saying, the legislature is saying they're not coming back until the end of April, essentially right. the 1st mm -hmm. of May. 
uh, we got, we're draining, we're blood, we're, we're losing money here hand over fist. And some of the, some of these work that's been done may have to be redone because contractors have gone to find other jobs. Let's play what if. What if everybody decided, okay, we're going we're gonna to figure out a way to get a budget passed. And they further decided, we want to do this before the short session. How long would it take them to get this and get it passed? Well, I mean, they can call themselves back into session at any point. Um, you know, if there was an agreement or there was real sub substantive negotiations going on, I think it could, it could happen very quickly. Um, it can also happen in April. But, you know, to, to this point, now that the Medicaid expansion essentially is off the table. That's where Governor Cooper had put all of his chips on the on the and negotiations. And there's some disagreement. Well, but now that the there's now, well, she just explained it's not off the table. It's perfectly we well, can still the, pass that bill that passed with bipartisan uh, support out of committee. Represent, Representative Donnie Lambeth, who is the leader and the sponsor of the bill, has said it's off the table. I think He's turned into a mortician. Did. Yeah, I guess. So. <laughs> well, He's there's too, there's bill. so much ambiguity with it that and uncertainty with it that has. Having these court rulings is one that I think that they have said we're not going to talk about this yeah, now. So the too is it would, would, I mean, as Rob said, the, the work requirements quite often are bogus and they can be damaging. So a lot of people on the left Agree also would All not right. would not like this. Okay, but talking about court rulings, uh, they're increasingly deciding public policy in our state. This week, another verdict, this time by a three-judge court of appeals panel, has banned the requirement for voter ID in elections. A constitutional amendment in 2018 approved by 58.5% of the voters, left details of implementing voter ID to the legislature, and in two separate attempts, the laws they've written have been struck down for voter suppression. Rob, it was unanimously agreed that no voter IDs would be required for the March 3rd primary. The big question now is whether essentially the, the ruling is going to rule out November's general elections for voter ID. I think it's likely. I think the court telegraph that it's likely to rule in plaintiff's favor and say that this was a law that was the statute was designed in a way to suppress the vote. It was designed in an unconstitutional way. And so uh, I guess it's conceivable that the General Assembly could come back into session. We know they will come back into session. They could try to pass yet another version of this. If they actually did it in a bipartisan, open, transparent way and sat down and negotiated it, we might actually Thank get you. We a, a were told one. that this second round of legislation was patterned after what other states have had. What, what is it well, that that's the this? Well, the puzzling thing with the courts is they have said that there is legislative intent for racial discrimination going back to actually decades in North Carolina. So if you're gonna, if the court is always going to say no matter what you do, it was based in racial discrimination, I don't know how you ever get past that. Well, I, that's, that's, a, that's a very good question. Uh, Erica, let me ask you this. Is there ever going to be voter ID legislation that isn't going to uh, draw opposition? I mean, the, the voters have approved it in the Constitution. Is there going to be a voter ID legislation that won't get uh, challenged in court? And if so, what is it? Well, you know, the voters in North Carolina who voted for voter ID did so because they wanted a more fair and honest process. Um, the way we've gone about it by writing a law that's going to disenfranchise certain populations by arbitrarily allowing one federal ID but not another federal ID, you know, that doesn't instill confidence in the process. So I think that we can take the time and get it right, but I think, you know, that um, that's one area we can really look at. I mean, we need to make sure that it's it's we're not choosing certain IDs that are more accessible for different populations. And, than and I think voter suppression in general is something, wouldn't you think most people don't want to suppress votes? I think people want every person who is eligible to vote to vote. Now, the question then becomes, how do you do that in a way that also satisfies the constitutional amendment which passed that doesn't also pr impose impediments that are unreasonable to people who are eligible to vote to get whatever form of identification they need. I'm not sure that we're ever going to have it here. I really don't know that Well, we another are. problem is, I mean, just the judges of that three-judge panel, two of those judges were, you know, have said in the past that they were opposed to any kind of voter ID. So this is another illustration of why who sits on those courts is so important. Rob Schofield, you get the last <laughs> word on I don't this think, subject. I don't think everybody wants everybody to vote. I think that the courts have found a pattern, a history, that the leadership of the North Carolina General Assembly wants the people to vote who will vote for them and that's what this is all about. Okay, but I, I get that argument that, that the history shows that that hasn't been the case, but 
But does that ne history necessarily ascribe to everything that gets passed? No, but they shouldn't have had a pass this in a lame duck session without involving the Democrats, without having a truly open process to write the law. That's what you need to do to write a fair voter ID law. Speaking of open processes, we're going to open one right now and ask the panel to tell us something we don't know. Becky Gray, I'll start with you. You mentioned at the top of the show that we had lost a, a true patriot, Representative Linda Johnson. And I, th I would be remiss if I did not just say again what a great um, representative she was. She was kind. She was funny. She had heroes in workers across North Carolina. Um, but she was tough as nails when she needed to be. We, we all need to be better and like her. Erica, tell us something we don't know. There was a recent uh, article that came out in Health Affairs that uh, looked at what was causing the higher mortality rates that we see in rural areas, and they found three specific issues that directly were directly attributed to that, and those were lack of adequate health insurance, provider shortages, and socioeconomic status. Interesting. Rick? Getting close to the primary election and of interest, uh, we discovered that the that a recent in the last two weeks a uh, a super PAC has opened that has bought eight hundred thousand dollars of advertising on behalf of Cal Cunningham in the Senate primary, mm. which may indicate that uh, some of the polling may be closer than we think in the primary involving mainly Erica Smith. Yeah, he's he's saying that's going to be a close race. Rob Schofield, quickly, tell us something we don't know. Y'all might have heard this week about this fake news site, North Carolina yeah. news headlines on Facebook. Facebook. Finally, Facebook got them to take it down. There's a new site up already that looks a lot like it. These, it's like whack-a-mole. We're going to be fighting them all year long. You know, it, it is really it's sad, and because uh, we recently learned that McClatchy Newspapers yeah. is, de is declaring Chapter 11 bankruptcy, it makes you wonder about the legacy of news coverage in our state, something that we should be concerned about. Well, you've heard our spin on the issues of the day. To stay informed all during the week, sign up for our free weekly email newsletter. Give your feedback and read my weekly column. Be sure to visit our website, ncspin.com, or catch NC Spin on Facebook. While there, be sure to subscribe to our podcast and also our YouTube channel. And join us next week as we set the stage for the March 3rd primaries. Until then, stay informed and watch out for the spin. In more than 21 years on NC Spin, I never endorsed a product or sponsor, but I volunteered to do this message for family physicians. Over the past 40 years, my family doctor could quickly diagnose my illnesses because he knew my medical history. Evidence suggests I'll live longer, have a higher quality of life, and save 33% on health care costs. I believe in my trusted relationship with my family physician. Family Physicians, your trusted health care advisor for life. Life's busy, but you're in control. As an electric cooperative member, you have access to lots of tools to help manage your home energy use and budget, so you can focus on what's most important. North Carolina Channel is made possible by the financial contributions of viewers like you who support the UNC-TV network.